also uh, suggest look at your prototype. Find some books, find some photographs. You can actually buy sometimes collections of photos, but look at some of the railroads and look at the dates on them and you get a better feel, possibly the same engine number you're wanting to do or something like that. Um, our actual organization has books and there's DVDs, you can find it. If you're modeling an era that's not current and you're looking for stuff that's older, that's a great way to go back and find some of the information you look for. I will say this, start simple, work with light touches and add little bits at a time. Don't try to blob anything on heavy at one time. Work in, work in very light doses so you don't overwhelm your model at one time with too much stuff at one time. And then there's different weathering techniques and they're gonna show up differently looking in different lighting. Uh, whether you've got fluorescent light, you got LED light, maybe you got soft tones or night lighting, but the different shadows and effects you get will make, make the, the railroad look a little bit different. So apologize, I forgot to advance the slide. Sorry about that. All that was in that slide that we just kind of talked about there and what, we, what we're talking about. Um, so what I'm gonna do is go to the next one. We're talking about some of the products. Um, some of the products we're gonna be showing today is uh, AK Interactive Paints and Pencils, Vallejo Paint Products, which uh, which are really nice as well. Tamea Panel Line Accent Coloring is, is some, Tamea makes some really good products as well. We're gonna be using the Pan Pastel Weathering Pastels. I, I really like those, I use a lot in this, what we're doing, but, but it's a mix of everything that I'm going through. Modelers Decals and Paint Acrylics, some of you may not be familiar with that product. Alpha abrasives, they're little micro brush applicators. I like using those. And when I say I like them, I, I've, man, I've used a lot of stuff. So I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that one thing's bad or one thing's worse. But when I tell you I like it, it means it's something I prefer to use over something else. And I like those, I like those items. So, and then I use a lot of paint brushes. Um, and I, I buy cheap paint brushes and I get these variety packs like it uh, go to uh, Michael's or one of these Hobby Lobbies or something like that. You can buy a container full of paintbrushes, sometimes for five or six bucks, and they don't have 25 or 30 paintbrushes in them. That's okay, because you know what? A lot of times I use it one time and I just I just tear the heck out of a paintbrush the way I do stuff on these models. But they don't really cost you that much, so it's not like you're out a ton of money. Uh, there are certain paintbrushes that I like using and I take really good care of them. And then there's certain ones that I don't care if I destroy them, I destroy them. That's just that's just the nature of the beast and doing some of this modeling. So uh, be prepared, but but definitely go by there. And a lot of times you can find these big variety packs and get you some that have some small tips, skinny tips, wide tips, soft bristles, a little stiffer. You get a nice variety because you never know what you're going to get into as you, as you start modeling with some of this stuff. So AK, I don't know if it's, some of y'all are familiar with this. Uh, AK makes a really good product. Um, I'm impressed with what they have. Took this photo just to show you a few of the items that I'm gonna be using. Um, you can use this in an airbrush, you can use it with a paintbrush, but there's different things. Uh, one of the things I noticed is you can take this, put it on a paper towel, and if you never use like a chinette type plate, which is really just a paper, but a little thicker plate, chinette style, you can you can wipe it off on that, and then you, you really end up on more of just a dry brush application versus having a slippery wet type paint. Um, but you get the same, you get the effect you're looking for. And keep in mind, all this we're talking about is I'm looking for an effect. I want, I want, I want something to look like something I've seen or I feel comfortable with, like in a photo or I remember seeing something. And so I'm looking for that effect to, to, to get something weathered. What I, what I am getting away from is that shiny brand new out of the box look. So um, I can't see, but I, I may ask this question when we get back to the other screen later. How many people have used AK? There's also a product in this called Vallejo, uh, Vallejo Model Wash. We're going to use that product in this as well. Um, I've had a hard time finding a good model wash, and, and I, I did stumble on this product, and, and I've tried it, and I like it. Vallejo makes a whole variety of paints as well. They make they make weathering paints and all that stuff, so uh, I just happen to use their model wash, and I do like that. You can use it. Um, uh, you can actually use it to put on... Uh, Spray on locomotives, cars, whatever you're trying to get a kind of a light white wash dusting on. Uh, you can use it with the airbrush or you can use it with a paintbrush. And, and, and in my case, I used it with a paintbrush on all these locomotives that we're going to see today. So 
And just so you get an idea, that's kind of where we're going with this. I'm just talking about the products and stuff. So, you, you know, if you're not familiar with some of the stuff, you know, you, you start to get familiar with it. And, I, and I'm trying to make sure everybody gets a little bit of, um, you know, see what's out there and what people use to do this different stuff. Now, this is something a lot of people may not be aware of, but AK also makes weathering pencils. It's a little different, but I'm going to tell you what, the, these little items right here, these are special. It's not that I'm trying to do the whole job with AK weathering pencils, but there's little specified areas on a model that using the, the, the streaking or the, the rubbing into it, man, does it really help. And it's just somewhere you can't always get a paintbrush to do what you want it to do. So I enjoy using these uh, pencils and you'll see later here in the presentation uh, how, how I actually used it in one of my applications here. So um, I doubt too many of you probably have seen these. I don't think a lot of people use these. So, I hope they get a little more popular with some of the model railroaders. If you see, AK has been heavy in the um, military model products and things like that. Uh, that that's where they've had a heavy usage of their product line, but um, but it adapts very well to what we do. I would actually say, as model railroaders, we're probably a little bit behind on some of this stuff, and they they really have a nice product mix that brings some, some really nice solutions for us as model railroaders. This little bottle of stuff right here goes a long ways. Um, it's just a little bottle. It's called panel line accent coloring. Uh, you kind of let gravity do its thing. This stuff, it, once it runs, it runs. It's almost like water, but it, but it, it, it makes the effect that you're looking for. And when I say that, when, a lo when water runs down, it mixes with everything else on a locomotive. It always starts on the high side and it goes down. And that's basically how we're weathering. We're starting at the top and working our way down. So this does exactly what we want it to do. And it, it rolls the, the, the liquid down in some of the crevices and, and, and gives it the same effect it would in an outdoor situation. So uh, for locomotives and cars, this, this is an excellent product to use if you've never used it. Most of the hobby shops offer it. You should be able to find it. I don't think it's that hard to find. It should be available, pretty readily available. Now. Got to have some nitro gloves. Now I'll tell you what, I hate rubber gloves. They, they get sweaty. They, uh, I can't stand them, but I like these things. These, these are comfortable, but I also wear them for another reason. They come up your wrist a little bit higher up more onto your forearm. The reason I like that is, is because when I'm messing with this stuff, sometimes you're spraying paint. Sometimes you're bumping on stuff. You're moving a model and you end up touching with your arm. I don't want to get fingered fingerprints on this, but I like wearing the glove. If not anything, I'll do the, do the old Michael Jackson. Look, I got one on my left hand and I'll use my other hand with my, I don't put one on my other hand, which I'm either painting or doing stuff with. But if I got to rotate or do something with the model or move it just a little bit, I want to have the gloves. The worst thing in the world you want to do is end up with a fingerprint right smack dab in the middle of your model. And as soon as you put applicator of weathering stuff on it, guess what you will see? You will see your fingerprint. It will show up. If you also wash your hands prior to working with your models with like a Dawn uh, soap, uh, it actually takes off some of the grease off your hands, and that will help also make for a chance you won't get a greasy or end up with an effect on your model to make it look bad. I hate spending all that kind of hard work and time and then find out you, you left a nice big fingerprint right in the middle of the roof. So not, not a good way to go. Now, Perry and I, we did a clinic a couple, uh, couple of years ago back during COVID. We, we talked about pan pastels online. Um, pan pastels are an excellent uh, product. They have a lot of variety of weathering colors that we can use. And so I kind of posted this picture to show you the variety pack that I'm going to be using in this presentation. Um, it doesn't take a lot with this stuff. You can use a paintbrush. You can use their sponge applicator. In, in my case, on this clinic, I totally used a paintbrush to do all the application that I did in the, this presentation. Um, but they have a nice variety. When I say that, the burnt sienna and stuff like that down there, there's black, there's grays, there's whites, and, and, and we're going to be using a lot of variety of these colors. So um, I am very pleased with this as a product. I use that in a lot of these applications. So, so to, this is all kind of a preface to where we're going. Uh, what we're going to see. And so I'm going to jump into the next thing. Bam. 
I've got a Atlas GP38. Now this thing is a bright red and white, brand spanking new, nice and shiny. The trucks are shiny, the fuel tank shiny. This is the ideal model to do weathering. Now, I mentioned a few months ago that I love the Seaboard Coastline. The Seaboard Coastline and the Clinchfield, unfortunately, they're black locomotives with yellow stripes on them. Now, weathering them is a lot of fun. Weathering them for a clinic and presentation, they're black. And unfortunately, they don't show up as well in everything you're trying to do. So I wanted to get something that has a little bit more effect with the camera. And I already model these same cars and engines. So uh, this makes a little bit more sense to use something. And that's one of the things of this clinic that I want to share with you is, is how the effect we're going to get. Each locomotive is different because of the different colors we're working with. I can apply the black on this white locomotive with white and red, and it will come out a heck of a lot stronger than if I apply it on the gray locomotive. So using the same particular item looks totally different depending on what color locomotives you're working with. So you learn to mix colors and do things and just kind of keep working it in. But I wanted you to see this because the Frisco, <coughs> excuse me, the Frisco was quite popular in the in the uh, in the pool of locomotives back in the 1970s and 80s. They uh, they brought a lot of engines over, <coughs> and they were you would see a lot on the lines coming. I, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia, and I saw a lot of these in Savannah. Saw a lot of them all over. So that's our first locomotive we're going to do. <coughs> the next locomotive will be an Atlas GP38. It's a family lines Clinchfield unit. And what makes it a Clinchfield unit? Not just the number, but it has the yellow number boards on it, not the white number. So it distinguishes very closely. Now, the Frisco was used in general purpose pretty much all over the system. Clinchfield was a heavy coal railroad starting in Spartanburg, South Carolina, all the way to uh, Elkhorn City, uh, Kentucky. And their operations involved a lot of heavy coal usage on the shift jobs up in the mines. And uh, a lot of the yards they had, they did a lot of heavy switching, but they were involved with a lot of coal. And the coal, the coal did have a heavy impact on these locomotives. Uh, over time, it shows up everywhere in every little crevice there is. You go into a mine where they're, where they're dropping in coal cars, it's going to blow dust. There's no, no way around it. So um, if you have a railroad that's in the coal area, you're going to get dusty and dirty. So, so this is a good one. This is kind of a medium French gray. And uh, the colors kind of affect it totally different than it does on that red and white. And then the next one is, is a nice Chessie locomotive. Everybody loves a Chessie locomotive. So I have an Atlas Classic. Now I will tell you this, it has a very slick surface. It's very shiny. And, and if I would just put, put it right on there, probably gonna slide off, wouldn't really adhere to it as well. It's a little too slick, brand new from the factory. But these were used very heavily. This is a GP7. They were used in a lot of the shift mine jobs. So it also was involved in a lot of the uh, coal areas. Of course, Chessie was a large system and they used them in a lot of the yards as well, but they did involve, they would put sometimes three or four of these on a train to move a coal cut. So um, it, it was a very heavily used locomotive. So I've got a lot of variety here, but this one, this one would have definitely been heavily weathered going into the seventies and eighties uh, because it would have been more, a little bit older locomotive coming into the system. So just to kind of share with you a little background of why, why I'm using these three different locomotives is because it gives us a nice different look effect on each one of these different colors. So, so let's talk about the Frisco, bright red and white. Uh, they didn't stay that way very long. Uh, white's about the worst color you can have in a locomotive series. Um, they're just not going to stay clean, but, uh, but they, sure, they sure do look good when they were brand spanking new. What makes this one a little bit different, the GP38 has a long fuel tank, which is very close to the trucks. Uh, this also means that your weathering effect is a little different because you're using a longer fuel tank than you are the shorter fuel tank. Um, it also creates a little more shadow closer to the wheels. And uh, we want to make sure we kind of bring out a little bit of pop in the trucks and, and get everything to, to look a little better for us. Right now, as you see with the black fuel tank, the black trucks, you can almost barely see anything inside those trucks. And, and they actually have excellent detail from Atlas back then. They, they did a very good job. Uh, also, if you look, the fans just look like, they look like plastic. That's exactly what they look like. They look like plastic. 
and we're going to change that effect as well. So there's things we want to get accomplished with this locomotive to, to take away from. A little bit more detail shot just so you can see the truck, but uh, you can see there is lots of opportunity for details inside these these trucks. And uh, you got the braking detail, you got the hood area. You, you can you can see little areas that right now just look like paint and plastic, just a little bit. They're very well done in the modeling process, but it almost looks like it looks like plastic too much. And that's what we uh, I want to look at this. That's one of the first things I want to notice. Also, keep aware. Talk about doing models. We're going to talk about the handrails too. Don't don't ignore the handrails because the handrails are part of the weather. It's stuff that has to be applied as well. Okay. When I look at this area, talk about the fuel tank. Don't know who's all on here tonight with us, but but the bottom line is, if you've never really gotten into the detail of these locomotives. You start to get a better understanding of what they're all about. Now, this is obviously very clean, but typically in this area where you see on the red dot on the kind of the left side, uh, that is a fuel filler right there. And there's a fuel gauge with a little bit of light red right sticking up about uh, about an inch or not from an inch, but just about a half inch from the end on the left. That area right there, that is where all the action happens when they when they go in to fill up these fuel tanks. Um, they spill it. I will tell you this firsthand. I observed this. Things were so different back in the 1970s. When they would take these locomotives into the fuel racks, they didn't have a little nozzle that has a little clicker like you do at the gas station when it gets full and it clicks off. They didn't do that with diesel fuel. They pull it and they put the nozzle in there and they let it rip. And then they go off and have a smoke break and get something to drink and they shoot the bull and they're in no hurry. And they probably got three or four locomotives and they're putting about 4,000 gallons on each one of these. Well, let me tell you something, it starts spilling out. Well, in the old days, they didn't have oil water separators in the 1970s. They had concrete platforms. They had the roadbed, the ballast, and it went in the ground. And they would spill hundreds and hundreds of gallons of runoff, just let that thing run until they got done with their smoke break and head back and pop that nozzle off of there. So these locomotives tend to have a lot of streaking in the fuel tank areas. So we want to make sure we pay close attention to fuel tanks because fuel tanks are definitely part of the weathering process that we don't want to ignore. Also, how the wheels splatter up on the on the bulkheads of the fuel tanks is pretty impressive, can be as well. So these areas not to be ignored, but one, but what I will say is what the fuel tank looks like at one end to the other is very different because of what happens with the diesel fuel. So if you've never actually studied a little bit about how these locomotives got handled, it makes a little more sense why they look like they do, especially in the 1970s. Now, things are a little different today. They have oil water separator racks and, and they don't want them to spill a drop of diesel fuel. They, uh, diesel fuel is like gold out there. They don't want to spill it. So uh, times have definitely changed. Talked about the radiator grills. Now, radiator grills are, that is an intake grill. It's not blowing out, it's taking in air. So it sucks up a lot of stuff. Now, depending on the area or the region you're working on, will maybe have an effect to how dirty or not dirty it is. Um, it also, if you get in an area with a lot of leaves or you work a local job and you're going through a lot of brush, it'll suck in all the leaves up there at the intake. So. All the different things that can get kind of caught up in those radiator grills uh, can get get pretty messy. I, I mentioned a few minutes ago talking about fog, fog or dense air with a lot of moisture in it, residue and dust and all that will settle on those uh, those as it pull it in the air. It will just settle on the metal and it will create a little bit darker effect. But it's not like an exhaust. It's just it just picks up anything in the air and, and it gets stuck to the grill side and then to the screens. And there are different types of screens that were put in these locomotives too. They're not all the same. They were wider ones, smaller ones, and all that good stuff. And then the front end, we don't want to ignore the front end of how a locomotive looks. Now, a, lo a locomotive that was brand new like this, man, it looks great, but I'm gonna tell you, back then they used to ride those footboards right there and there was a lot of grease. And I mentioned something about the handrails. Well, you gotta remember the guys that are riding these engines, their gloves were dirty, their hands were dirty, their blue jeans were dirty, and their, their dungarees were dirty. And when they grab those handrails, they get smeared with a lot of grease and oil and everything else. 
Doug, Doug kind of liked my description of this thing because this is a down and dirty, greasy locomotive sometimes when you get onto them. So um, what you see right there is a perfect example. <laughs> it doesn't stay that way very long. But you also get all the splatter that comes up if it's another locomotive in front of it. You get a lot of splatter off the roadbed. And it also comes up from just running down the road. You get dust that comes up from the from the ballast line. And it also has effect of all the stuff that gets all over the locomotive. The higher side of the nose won't be as dirty. It'll be all down at the pilot and all around the walkway and, and where the, uh, uh, basically from the handrail down on the front is primarily the dirty area. But you do get a lot of handling. If you're not familiar with diesels back then, right there in the very middle at the very point of the nose of the hood, there's a little piece right there. That is a sand filler. And so the maintenance crews back then were the hostlers would go in and they would pull a hose down and fill those full of sand for the traction for the locomotives. So they were handling stuff and hoses were rubbing against those noses of the locomotive with the black rubber hoses and also their dirty hands and gloves would always get right on the, the edge of that uh, uh, nose area. So that would also have an effect where there's a lot of dirt and grime constantly. Um, you got to remember these, these locomotives were used a lot. I mean, these are not something that, you know, they, they were dirty, grimy locomotives just from the conditions they worked under every day. So as I get started here, I apply a little bit of the, uh, the panel line liquid and you'll see if I put it in there, it just starts to run down the crevices a little heavier to the front, a little lighter to the back, just so you can kind of see how it starts to fill. And well, all of a sudden when you do that, you now start to see there was a lot more detail between the vertical slats that you didn't see when it was just straight plastic. All of a sudden, you're starting to see there's more detail inside that grill that just kind of pops out at you. So that's one of the neat things that I like being able to, to, to detail a locomotive is being able to see some of this stuff and how it actually appears to you. And as you notice, I didn't go anywhere outside the rectangle of the fan box. I just stayed right in there. But the, the little applicator that comes with the uh, the find the little black line stuff that I was showing you earlier from Tamiya, that stuff, it, 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 it goes a long way. You don't want to have a lot on your little brush, just a little bit of drop in there and it'll run quickly for you. So I'm going to go to the next slide just so you can kind of see how it's being applied. So that that's it right there. And it just kind of, it just takes off. Gravity does its thing, but it's staying right in those grooves of those vertical slats on that intake. Now that is a generator intake for the blower. <coughs> right below it's the blower, but right up the, that is actually taking in the uh, the generator. It sits right behind the wall there, and uh, the generates a lot of heat, and so you tend to get a lot of weathering going on right in this area as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, it's one of the reasons I'm talking about this. It's not just about the weathering; it's why it's getting weathered a certain way. I just said something about the heat. When you get the generator and it's generating a lot of heat, it also fatigues the metal, may burn the metal, it may weaken the metal, and that paint will, will start to break down over time. That's where the rust starts to come in once that break, the paint breaks down. So really, it's a good area to really start applying some, some really fine weather is right there in that area. A lot of people talk about weathering, but they don't really talk about what the locomotive does and why it gets weathered this way. And this is one of the thing, neat things I really wanted to share with y'all as we talked about this tonight. So I also start to look at those latches. Those latches get a lot of dirt build up and grime inside those. So I like to kind of start putting a little bit of black stuff in there. Again, this we're just starting out, starting to put some colorization into this thing. If you notice, everything's still kind of white. Um, the dynamic blister will also take in uh, air. Uh, again, it really depends if you're going through areas that have a lot more dirt intake, such as if you're going through tunnels, you're going to be sucking in a lot more dirty air than you would be if you just work in an area. If you work in a plant, you take these things in a plant, maybe a mill like in Birmingham or something like that, you're probably going to get a lot more dirty as you got dirt and grime or a paper mill or something, you're going to be picking up a lot more res res residue as well. So those definitely have an impact on the, the dirtiness of these locomotives. <laughs> That's one of the neat things of picking up like a GP40 or GP7. They worked a lot of the shift jobs. They worked a lot of the plants. They were road engines, but they, they were road engines slash switching jobs, where today most locomotives are just road engines. They don't do a lot of switching in plants. All that's done by uh, usually by uh, non-union railroads. 
Now, talk about the roof. <coughs> I'm starting to put, starting to apply a lot more weathering technique into this, but in the very middle is that that radiator fan goes to the dynamic brakes. Now that is a high heat area right there. The dynamic brakes when being applied generate huge amounts of heat. There's also two exhaust stacks, one on either side of that fan for the diesel engine. Now, what will happen is those will spit out a bunch of carbon residue that will land on the roof over time. And so it will get really, really black. But it also, as we were talking about earlier, as you get that heat build up, you will also get the paint job start to deteriorate and you'll start to get a lot of rust in those areas as well. So that's one of the reasons I like to start weathering really heavy right there those exhaust stacks start really applying a lot of the carbon buildup and then kind of you work your way out to the edges and you're still going to want to apply a light touch of the rust using the um, pan pastels in this area. Everything, everything doing right now that we use the the other thing a minute ago with the, the liquid but I'm starting to use the pan pastels here and start to kind of run a, a streak of it. I used about an eighth inch brush and I go vertical from the top down just spreading the the pan pastels in there causing the vertical motion to, to make whatever goes down in a vertical application. So I don't use the rubber applicator or use the sponge applicator in this particular case. I try to get in those grooves where the blower is over there. I try to get in between the uh, air intake and the blower and get a pretty heavy. The one thing I probably would like to have done a little bit more streaking in that blower area because that's where it ends up happening. So any questions so far, Perry, from anybody? I just can't see them. Okay. I will. I will go look. All right. Now, I mentioned in my early part of the of the presentation, um, I use a lot of the micro brush applicators. I don't know if everybody's familiar with those or not. They were real popular there a while back, but I'm not sure how many people maybe lost track with them. These things are very useful in what we're doing. Uh, I love a good paintbrush, but but these applicators are disposable. They're very, they're very lightweight. They got enough rigidness to them, but you can get into pretty tight spots with them. So I like using them because you can use them with glue. You can use them with paint. You can use them with pan pastels. You can use them for different things. Like this little pack that I'm showing you, it's got about a hundred of those things in there. They're, just, they're pretty much disposable is what they are, but, but they're very handy to have. And when they're wore out, they're wore out. You throw them away, but it's, it's, it's good. It's a good tool to have. If you look right behind it, you'll see my little jar of paintbrushes. And actually, my cut right next to it is full of paintbrushes as well. Never have enough paintbrushes because you go through them like crazy. So, especially when you start weathering, you're going to go through a lot of different stuff. So, um, and you can see the pan pastels. I just leave leave them in the tray usually. I don't pull them out of that tray. Then when I put the cover back up, they're all covered, and I don't have stuff spilling out or messing up anything. But if you uh, the applicators come in different ones. That pack that you're looking at, that is what they call the super fine applicator. Um, but they make different uh, different thicknesses depending on what your actually your application is and stuff. So if you never used before, I highly encourage. Okay, so now we get back down to let's get a little bit more dirtier. We're getting into this back to that blower and back to that intake. You start to see where I'm starting to really get the weather and effect going on. I'm also applying a little bit of light stuff on the truck, so you can see. The trucks have lightened up and you can start to see that the, the more the detail is starting to show up. I also got a little bit of rust up in there where the bell's at and a little bit of rust up in there where the fuel intake uh, uh, hole is. Right there is where there's a lot of action because you get a lot of stuff that happens right there. Um, but that's these are the areas where you want to start to get a little bit of detail smudged up in there. And also right along below the footboard, the walkway, platforms. I like working a lot of smudging going on right there. And that's that's kind of what the effect I'm working with is, is using the brush and just kind of working different colors into those grooves. And you'll see where the door panels are. As you start to come across, you'll start to see that shadow effect getting in that groove a little bit and, and starting to, to get the color effect that you really want. Now this next slide I'm going to start to apply using the streaking grime from AK and that has the number on the bottle right there. It's AK012. Um, I like this. This does exactly what I want it to do. 
it's a streaking grime. The only other thing I've ever used was a Flocal product from years ago, and it did the same thing. Flocal would, would do the same exact application, but I want to show that fuel, and it, may, it creates kind of like a slick spot on that middle of that, uh, of that fuel tank. So in the 1970s and 80s, like I told you, they would spill fuel everywhere. And, and so you also got to remember, when you got dust coming up from the ground, the dust would stick to the fuel tanks. You get rain, you get water, you get splatter, and then you got fuel, and it becomes real sticky. And everything that's in the air would just stick to that diesel fuel. Now, they, they put enough diesel, the diesel fuel would sometimes wash the other grime right off from the previous time, but uh, that's just kind of how it affected. But this AK, I'm using the micro brush applicator to do this because I don't need a lot. I shake it very well. Just put a little bit of this on there, but it's like an enamel, so it's going to go on a little differently. But this next slide starts to show you. <clears throat> There's my fuel tank. That's exactly what I wanted. It's showing the runoff. It's showing the, the fuel to splatter all in there, coming off the fuel tank and running down. And that's exactly what it does. And you'll do that on both sides of the locomotive. And uh, I don't know if all y'all have ever done that or used that application, but it definitely works. And uh, I'm, I'm real pleased with the effect it, it presents to you when you're trying to do a model like this. So as you notice, this locomotive has totally changed. It's not it's not the bright red and white it was in the very beginning. But see how those trucks are starting to pop out. Look at this slide. I've been uh, each one of these slides. I keep adding a little bit more, a little bit more, and you're starting to really see the detail starting to come out in some of those trucks. <laughs> So this is a little bit more backup view to this whole thing. You start to see some of the colorization. Now I tried some, I put a little bit of rust over there on top of the fuel just to see what it would do on top of it. It gave me a pretty good effect. Um, I dropped a little bit more rust in certain areas and uh, you do get a lot of weather effect right in the, right below the walkway to the left of the cab. Typically those were battery boxes. Battery boxes, there was a lot of stuff happening right there, and they would leak all kind of corrosion and stuff like that. So that was one of the areas that also you usually have to watch when you weather. <laughs> I also went back and took the pan pastels and took the burnt sienna and started applying it to the roof area. Uh, after I got a little bit more on there, I, I was able to start applying that. It gives a little more, kind of like the faded. It's not that smooth paint anymore. It's giving it more of a faded look. And you can see the exhaust areas. I started kind of blending colors in there. You know, more of a burnt sienna uh, right around there with the black mixed in together around the exhaust stacks. So, so the locomotive is definitely taking a little bit different look than it was when we first started. So, so that's on a red and white locomotive. So let's see what happens when we go to the French gray of the family line system. Okay, so here, here's what we got. The gray totally looks different. <clears throat> the black pops out a little bit better already just because of the gray. Uh, same kind of locomotive, same build. If you notice, the fuel tank is smaller on this particular model. They did have two versions of the GP38, one of the larger fuel tank, one of the smaller one. Um, but, but the trucks are exactly the same. So I'm not doing everything on this one exactly the same. But, but I do want to get some of those colors and, and get some of the stuff that pulls out on this one to make it look different. As I said, the family lines, this was probably on the Clinchfield, uh, was, was definitely heavy in the coal uh, switching area. So it's going to have a little bit different look. So this time I tried something a little different. I wanted to see how it looked against the black field tank. I had the other product for Mahler decals and paint products on the field tank here. I didn't use the same thing. And I tried that. Personally, I don't like the look as much, but I think it still gave me the look effectively. It's okay. But I think the AK definitely does a better job on the field tank than this did. But I figured I would give it a try and, and, and start to show you some of the different effects depending on what products you use and stuff like that. So <clears throat> I like that, but it's it's not that it doesn't work. It's just not probably what the look I was actually looking for. Now, a lot of times, this really, one of the reasons I'm doing this is to give you some idea what happens with some of these different products. If you've never bought this stuff before and you're saying, well, what do I buy? What do I use? This gives you a chance to start to get a better feel for maybe what should I buy and what should I, what, where should I invest my money at? especially if you're brand new to this. Now, I'm using the Pan Pastels, the 800.5 Black series of uh, Pan Pastels. I'm using that and brushing that in over there at the, uh, over the generator intake, uh, air intake, and trying to just get more of a coal dust look right in that area. 
kind of a little bit on the other fans, but kind of similar to what the other locomotive was. But if you notice, the black totally works a little different on this. I didn't run the the black stuff in the liquid. I went straight with pan pastel in that area. And that's one of the things I'm doing here. I'm giving you some different applications for different locomotives and different processes, depending on what you want to try out and stuff. As I said, the Clinchfield had a lot of tunnels. And so with those tunnels came a lot of blowback from exhaust and everything else bouncing off the tunnel walls. Uh, we just get all kind of sudden and um, uh, uh, carbon build up from the exhaust, you know, bouncing all over the, the shell of the locomotives. <clears throat> now, here's another product we're gonna try out. I wanna try out the, 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 the rust, the crusted rust. And we use the applicator. As you notice, it's got the black coupler. Typically, if you've ever walked into a locomotive, I don't think the couplers are ever pretty black, except for when they're maybe brand new, put right on there. They're gonna have some rusted look. So I wanted to try that, see what it looked at, but that is the eight, that's an AK product that I'm using, using the micro applicator. Thought we'd give it a try and see what it does. So let's take a look and see what it does. Here, I went ahead and applied the rust to the coupler. See what you think, I, I don't know. I, my, not sure about it. I'm not sure if it's a little too shiny. It may need some little flattening in there. I'm not sure. But as you start to see, a lot of good detail right there on that locomotive at the footboard, you know, with the things we can do and stuff. So I'm trying to hit different highlights, different things throughout this presentation just to kind of give you an idea of what you what you have and what you're doing with the, you know, the different engines and things like that. But you know, it, it definitely will give you a full effect of what you're working with, depending on what the color of the locomotive. Now, we talked about the weather and pencils. Yeah, I talked about that earlier. This is the medium rust, and I wanna use it to apply down there where the uh, journal bearing is on the uh, wheel axle. Um, I like that little area, and that's a hard area to weather sometimes without getting us all over the place. And I just took the very tip of the pencil and just kind of drew on those bearings where the, where the bolts are, and it gets a little bit rusty down there sometimes uh, over time and just applied it just a little bit. And also right there where the spring is, I'll show you a little bit more on the next slide, but that's the pencil right there and, and that's the number on it. So if you, you don't wanna try those, doesn't take a lot, but you just kinda of rub your pencil on it and it'll, it'll scrape off right on wherever you want it. And I am happy with that. I think this is a good product. If you never tried them, I think you really wanna get into weather and I think this is a good one to use because you can also sharpen them use them on buildings and things like that, maybe a pipe or something like that, and apply it onto it. See, now you see a little bit better on this slide, the, the coloration. And this is what weathering does. That truck is definitely giving you a better look now. You, you, it's not, it's more defined putting weathering on. It's not that same factory look anymore. And that's what I was trying to get rid of it. I wanted to get a little bit more look on that truck. And, but that weathering pencil, I, I I'm very happy with it. I think that's a good product and uh, if you'd ever used it. There's about about four different colors on that truck right now between the pan pastels and the, and the AK stuff. It's about four different colors on that truck. So it gives you an idea that it's it's not just a black truck anymore. So any questions so far while I keep moving on? We good? And I'll have, I'll have time at the end too when you want to ask questions as well. Okay. So what time is it? It's chessy time. <clears throat> I guess I'm fond of the chessy. There's something about the chessy system. I love Clinchfield, but there's something about the chessy system that has a special place. And I love the locomotive. I love the schemes. They were workhorses. Uh, they moved a lot of product and a lot of coal. Uh, and, um, I, there's something about looking at that locomotive, the vermilion blue and the yellow. It's just, it's just a really cool looking scheme. So uh, obviously, like I said, it's, it's a little too new. It's got a little too much sheen to it of, of newness. Um, they wouldn't have lasted along the railroad. So we want to get that effect off of there and get it like it's been well used and well operated in the field. So the first thing I did on this one is I took that Vallejo model wash that we talked about. And I actually came back and I hand brushed that locomotive with Vallejo wash all the way around it. That way it stayed out of the windows and all that. But what it did, it dulled it down some and it gave it, I didn't airbrush it, I hand brushed it. 
and I was very, very pleased with the look to give me a, something to work. It's like a canvas. I needed that flattened out just a little bit, and that's what it did. It, it gave me that little bit of flattened look. So when I start applying the pan pastels, it has something to stick to. And, and, if, and if you've never done this before, it, it, it's, it's nice to have something. Um, if you've ever worked with like um, AccuRail cars, they're, they're kind of a flat finish. They're real easy to start applying pan pastels to. Some cars have a real slick finish. You've got to get that slickness gone before you start working with it sometimes. Just to, you, need the, you need to look better and you need that stuff to stick to it better. So these, I started with two different colors. I started with the Pan Pastel 740-3 Burnt Sienna Shade and the 780-5 Raw Umber. And I just started brushing the heck out of this after the, uh, after the Blejo had dried. I started applying this in different areas. Uh, the one step I didn't tell you, I did use the little black liquid stuff on, the, on all the little grills and vents right there just to give it a little highlight. And then I started applying this in, inside on this locomotive. If you can notice very quickly, just in this photo, using those two colors, I went really heavy on the roof line with a lot of the rust color and then came back with a lighter color on top of that just to kind of dull it down. And, and I was happy as it was going. I was going to apply more, but I was very happy. Got really, really heavy right around those exhaust stacks. I thought that they turned out quite well <clears throat> as I got around the exhaust stacks. Got a lot of darkness in there. Um, blue is a, a different color to kind of work with than your standard blacks and other colors. As you notice, that yellow starting to dull down some. <clears throat> so I get a little bit more in there, I start brushing it more and more on the roof. I, I, the, the, the roof jobs really got banged up pretty good on these locomotives. Um, and so, yeah, I was real pleased how it started to apply. Putting a lot of weather and fading on top of that. All this was done with a hand brush. And, uh, but I liked it. Now, one of the things, the areas I don't want you to forget about when you're weathering these locomotives is the walkways. See, we're all focused on the side, but when you're looking down on it, you don't want a bright, shiny walkway. So you need to get in there with that brush without damaging your handrails. Go in there real finely and kind of hit, work your walkways and get those dirty as well. You got to remember, these guys are walking in dirt, mud, grease, and everything, stepping on those walkways. And so those walkways get really filthy. Especially if you think about it, the one right behind the locomotive engineer is the exit door. So they go, they go right out that door behind him and they go out the other side, out the front door to get out on the locom on the, on the landing. So if you really think about the traffic pattern, those two areas would be dirtier than the other areas because there's no entry or exit going in and out the cab. So they would definitely be going in right there behind the locomotive engineer. Started working those smokestacks. I was real pleased with this. Just those two colors alone. I hadn't even applied any black in there. That's just, that's using those two different colors just to see what I would get. So I could get some kind of dry look to it, get a little more buildup, and then, then start getting ready for the carbon buildup that I want to move toward. But I, I thought that this really starts to turn out pretty cool. As you notice, it's still got a little bit of sheen to it. There's little spots in there I haven't hit. I think by this next slide, you'll start to really get a feel how this thing starts to turn out. So I really focused on the lower body assembly here, got into the trucks. The blue creates a whole new challenge when you're trying to do these. The vermilion is a very nice color, but man, it just, it, it bleeds through everything. Got in there and worked a little bit of black in there, worked the fuel tank area, worked the air reservoirs right behind the fuel tank, worked the handrails, worked the uh, spillover from the walkways, Using always that downward stroke, trying to get the, the, the same effect that if water ran off the locomotive, where would it go? Uh, so it's kind of a downward stroke with a little bit of stroke to the back, just a little bit, kind of about, about a 30 degree angle. So if you know, if you're moving in motion, the water would be coming down and sliding backwards. <clears throat> so, but this locomotive has really started to turn out and I'm very pleased with that look. As, as you know, you remember what it looked like when we started, it was that bright yellow and blue and, and it really toned it down very quickly and I was very happy with this. So, uh, as you notice, we, you know, we're taking three different locomotives, three different colors and, and getting totally different effects out of three different locomotives. So here, this is one of the things that always concerns me when people start in the weathering. A lot of people overdo the weathering. 
always bothers me when you see a locomotive it looks like you know you know you get a 1990s locomotive or a 2000 series year locomotive and uh it'd be 2002 and it looked like the locomotive had been through 30 years of hard service and, and that's not typically how it works and uh, it takes a few years for them to get dirty and greasy and grimy but if you look on top of this locomotive between the the hood of the cab and toward the front nose i built it up i took that black that you saw on that last slide look at that exhaust stack i started building that carbon up over the rust and the other colors i had and started applying just a little bit of light black up there to get the coal effect i was looking for <laughs> Also went back and put a little bit of the black on the walkways and just a little bit of streaking right along those uh, below the panels below the cap. <clears throat> and just added a little bit of black, but you'll start to see it really, it really burst out really good. I was real pleased with that. <laughs> the one last touch, I came back with a little bit of that white. Remember I talked about batteries and all that good stuff, and I just put a little bit of the white in there to give a little bit of the corrosion look coming off the side area right there. And uh, I thought that, that that was very appropriate right in that area. Overall, it turned out really sweet. So um, so that chassis, chassis it took a, took a little bit of a beating, but uh, that was pretty much a typical looking chassis locomotive on the system. If you notice in this slide, the left side is weathered. Look at that right handrail on the very on the opposite side. I didn't weather that one yet. That just gives you some kind of quick comparison how how putting a little bit of weathering application just tones it down and gets rid of that little bit of a sheen that we're wanting to make it to look real. And that ultimately is what I'm that's what I'm all about. I want my locomotives to look real. And and so that that's the effect that I'm looking for. Okay. So <clears throat> This is my last slide for the night, but I wanted you to see this. I wanted to do the SD45. I really ran out of time to get it ready. I was also concerned it would make my slides, my presentation a little bit longer than I wanted to. But uh, what I, I will tell you, this is a scale strains SD45. I'm going to take this per exact photo of that locomotive at a certain time of its history. I'm going to weather this one up. I'll share it with y'all sometime. I saw tons of SP locomotives. I guess SP just didn't do nothing to their locomotives because I tell you what, they were the worst looking locomotives on any system. But <clears throat> they dogged the heck out of them. But they they would typically be a lot of dry, dry dusting along the truck line, all the way across the fuel tank. Then you would get a lot of heavy, heavy rusting coming out of the blower. Um, uh, intake area where the generator is uh, in that area you would see a lot of heavy uh, rust and, and streaking coming out of there uh, the, the hoods would be real dry I guess it was due to they ran a lot in the desert and the heat was really rough on the on the paint job so you get a lot of stuff in there and then of course you know that's a 20 cylinder engine um, and so the the, uh, the exhaust coming out of there is a lot bigger than obviously a GP40 so the, uh, the the exhaust stack will carry a lot more uh, carbon buildup out of that area. But um, these ran in my area. I love I love watching them. The SD45s, SD45-Ts. We saw a lot of them in the 1990s coming through on the CSX when I lived in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, they were always on that line. Uh, kind of they were more the intermodal carriers at the time pulling across the country. So I enjoyed watching these. They would bring them over. But uh, that's going to be my next project that I want to finish. That That is a scale trains SD45, like I said. Very impressive locomotive. It's got nice detail to it. I'm really looking forward to it. But I will tell you this. It's got a pretty good little sheen to it that I'm going to have to get toned down. But I will tell you what I'm going to try on this next one. I'm going to do some airbrushing on this next one. I'll share with you all when I get done with it, um, with the division somehow. But I, I wanted you to see this, how it looks today. And the next time you see it, I hope it looks really different. So uh, that is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm willing to take questions, um, and I don't know what we need to do here. Well, what do I need to do here, Perry? Um, uh, well, there there have been a couple that have popped up. Um, okay. What was the best way to pre-clean models before weathering? I stick them outside for five years and get them ready. And, uh, okay, that that works. No, I tell you, um, 
if you want to take, the, I didn't take the shells off on these. Um, I clean them with a little bit of warm water um, and soap. And then you can take a hair dryer and kind of dry them. Don't get it too close to the plastic, but take a hair dryer if you want to clean them uh, and get them very clean. Again, remember the gloves I talked about. That's one of the great yeah. ways to do it. So uh, can I go back to the screen somehow? What do I got to do? Um, uh, you can stop sharing. Okay. And I'll come back to That's the main the screen. That's the first part. Go. All right, now I can and see everybody now, again. Sorry, I couldn't see everybody. So, um, so what are some of the other questions? Did that answer that question? Was that satisfactory? Yeah, just leave it outside for five years. That'll get it, <laughs> that'll get it pre-cleaned. Uh, yeah. You, you can actually set a locomotive if you don't get it too high. You can put it in a window if you got good light on it. It'll take the natural sunlight. would do a lot of fading on it. That's and that's one of the other things of weathering that actually do happen is natural sunlight totally deteriorates the paint jobs on these locomotives. Now today they usually can't get deteriorated long enough because they get they usually get uh, uh, they get tagged so bad so fast they don't get time for the paint to fade on them anymore. They get covered in uh, graffiti. So uh, they got a whole nother paint job on them. So um, another question popped in and I and I can answer this one too, but you're the clinician. How much weathering comes off when you have to pick the engine up to work on it? Not a lot, actually. Um, yeah. I don't like handling them too much, but but I, I'm a little more careful how I handle them and where I grab them and stuff. But uh, you don't want to smear it. The, the pan they are correct. The pan pastels, you know, are very sensitive to the touch sometimes. Uh, that is probably the difference between using the enamels and, and using the airbrushing techniques where they're a little more solidified. Um, you know, or the like that, but the pan pastels do look good and I like the way the effect is. And, and so I try not to handle them in certain areas where I would, you know, smear something or put a fingerprint right in the middle. So you can seal with dull coat immediately after. I've not found that that's been necessary weathering with pan pastels. Um, I wasn't real happy with a dull coat solution. Now, there may be another product, but I wasn't happy with the tester's dull coat. No, on it after pan pastels because I felt like I lost some of the effect that I was looking for to start. With. Yeah, I I even found the same thing with um I I like the Tamiya flat finish and I like the Mister Hobby flat finish, but I even used um Tamiya flat finish on a roof that I did with pan pastels and it and even it wiped out most of it. I don't use. Um, yeah, usually they recommend anymore. don't don't seal it up because it will do that. Oh. It'll, it'll actually wipe off what you just work so hard to, to make look so good. I've only had an issue with one locomotive. Um, I'm not sure exactly why. I, it may have been the the fuel tank itself, but I tend to pick up my locomotives with the fuel by the fuel tank, and I've had one smudge on one locomotive fuel tank and I just re-weathered it. Um, yeah, and that's what I said in the beginning. A lot of times I just wear the glove on the left hand. Yeah. Keep this one free to handle my bottles and my brushes, but I use this one with the glove on it to handle the locomotive. That yep. way if I just grab it, I don't I don't even think twice. I just have the glove on and I pick it up and it's just kind of a natural I'm right handed, so I just immediately want to handle it with my left hand. So Steam steam locomotives are a very different topic. Um, because the whole different they, beast. Yeah. Yeah, the, the completely different topic because they're a completely different animal. Um, I mean, a lot of the maybe, same techniques apply, but you're yes. but there's different there's different things you do to a, to the uh, to the boiler versus a diesel locomotive, and you know that was one of the things I was trying to share was to. Focus on the features of the diesel and especially, you know, right out of the beginning, you know, a lot of mine are 1970s and 80s style locomotives that I do. So um, that's, that's personally what I like and I, and I operate, but it's, you know, that's what I look at. But as we got later in the 1980s, locomotives got a little dirtier, they got a little grimier and as they wore out and then the, the 8-40Cs came in and the 8-40Bs came in and some of the stuff started to phase out real quickly. So. You're going to be very happy with those that come out then. Um, we'll have to get someone like Dr. Nojik, Dr. Joe Nichols Jr. to do one on on steam wet on steam locomotives because that's the era he runs. So, any other questions? Is that it. Uh, do you do any post treatment 
per the touching comment. No, I don't do it. I still don't do any um, post treatment on my locomotives or my cars. Now, I would say that if you run rolling stock and you were in a modular group and you pack your cars, not your locomotives, up every single time you run, I might flat finish those after weathering and then um, and then maybe apply another layer of, of pan pastels or something over yeah. the probably flat going to finish. need if you're doing a lot of handling, you probably need to do you're probably going to need to actually do more airbrushing type techniques. Yeah, you might need to, but on a it home depends. layout, I don't do any post treatment at all. I mean, I, I like using that, and that's one of the things that this clinic hopefully shared with you. There are different techniques and different yep. products and different applications. And I'm not I'm not saying don't do the airbrushing because the airbrushing gives a whole different effect that I like too. Yep. It's just not if you're you may be new in this hobby or you're looking to start doing some of this, it's a fairly inexpensive way to get started without buying a compressor and everything else. Um, but you know, sooner or later you may want to get a, a compressor and airbrush yep. and try some stuff. But it's just uh if you got some existing situations, it's a way to really jump on this thing and start enjoying some of the things you want to try. Again, yep. as I recommend, I, I don't highly recommend over weathering anything. I recommend yep. working in very light stages. And even with an airbrush, you don't, you're just going to make light sweeps and see how it affects. And you got to give it some time to dry and you got to look at it in different light because it will look different in different lighting. So yep. that's one of the effects, but I, I, I just really am not big on, you know, a locomotive unless it's like sitting on a deadline and it's been really brutalized and over, over its generations of efforts. So, yeah. And Anybody else? Yeah, uh, that's it so far. So okay. um, we'll probably take you off of the stage. Mm, and, well, I appreciate um, y'all listening in. And we will put um, um, Bob Young up on the stage. And uh, let me go off to participants and grab him. So give me a moment, Bob. Uh, you took me. There we go. We put we put we put Bob on the stage now. So, Bob. Oh, and we need to unmute you. <laughs> and now I've sent you an unmute. Re I've sent you an unmute request. Okay. Can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Okay, hey everybody. Uh, I'm Bob Young. I'm having an open house this weekend coming up on Sunday from one uh, to four in the afternoon. Uh, a little bit about the layout. Uh, it's I model the Pennsylvania Railroad Middle Division and uh, includes uh, Altoona. Um, and uh, there's a rendition of Horseshoe Curve. Uh, I my Eras are from 1945 to 1959, which gets me into the transition area, which allows me to run steam and diesel. Uh, it's probably 97% uh, scenic. And uh, we'll be running uh, different trains. So we'll be running steam, we'll be running diesel, passenger, uh, and uh, freights and coal hauls. So, uh, if you're uh, around Sunday afternoon, uh, come over, come see me, and uh, come see my layout. So, thank you. And his layout is in the member, and his open house is in the members only section on the website. So, just go look there and you'll find him. Thank you. Yep, thank you. And Tom, you're back. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Oh, fabulous. Great. That was a fabulous clinic. Um, really enjoyed that. It made me go back and pull some books down and start looking through <laughs> oil spills and things. And yeah, they're there. And I saw some really good battery corrosion pictures. So anyway, um, upcoming stuff. And Bob, yeah, hope you have a good crowd. Yeah. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, upcoming stuff, we have um, May 9th is the next meeting. Uh, Stefan Bartowski is doing a 
session on modeling the Tate Georgia station, which ought to be really interesting. Uh, bring and brag, uh, bring a building. <laughs> if you don't have to rip it off your layout, you know, just uh, <laughs> one that you can bring. That would be really nice. Um, uh, particular um, events of notice is in July, we're going to do a swap table type thing um, during the um, division meeting. People can bring things. We haven't gotten all the details worked out, but uh, it's not like bring everything you have to sell. It'll be bring a smaller amount of things and you can swap wheel and deal and, and um, you know, trade off some of the stuff that you, you don't need any more and pick up some things from other folks that have things that you might need. So um, that's what we're looking at. Um, other than that, um, that's about all we have. Um, any other questions or anything or? It's kind of unusual. I, I can't see anything else new. Let's see. We'll be we'll be back to live and in person in May since the church will not be closed. That's right. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that's kind of some in a humor to it. Okay. Good deal. Um other uh there's a thing.